Welcome to The Pestle, reviewing and breaking down movies to look for insights into the movie-making process. Hosted by Swarley and Teddy Westside. Let's dim the lights and start the show. Welcome everybody to The Pestle. Today's show is brought to you by Pine and Oats. The breakfast for dinner cereal, so good that it should be a crime. Eat Pine and Oats. Welcome everybody to The Pestle. I am Wes. <laughs> and I am Todd. And this is a film podcast where we as filmmakers like to, you know, just say random things. Uh, not, not at all. We, we try to pick a part of film if we can. Um, some films are easier to dissect than others. <laughs> no mm-hmm. uh, foreshadowing there at all. Um, and, <laughs> and uh, I mean, we're, we are. This is what we do with our life, not necessarily review films. We, we get zero money. Uh, well, maybe not zero. Um, we now, zero. through our Patreon, yeah. earn almost enough to pay for our monthly uh, hosting uh, costs for the podcast. Um, but through our normal jobs, we are you know, filmmakers, you're a full-time producer as well as musician. Um, I've been a full-time filmmaker for nine years now. And one of the things, uh, I, I had an intern for a while and I've had two on and off right now. My current intern is on summer hiatus. Uh, not sure if she's coming back for the fall or not. Um, but normally, uh, one of the things that, you know, I've come, come to learn, I no longer remember why I invoked my intern, but, uh, I've been doing, (laughs) you know, as a full-time filmmaker for the last nine years, oh, that's where I was going. Uh, we would have, you know, my intern and I would have conversations and, you know, I try to help her navigate her career, uh, give her advice when I can. But one of the first things, um, I, I tried to impress on her was you only need one thing to make it as a as a full-time filmmaker um and it's deceptively simple uh and and the one thing you need is a client like you need someone that is willing to pay you for what you do um and so do one thing do it well and slowly build your build out your portfolio uh, but one of the things about having a client is god i i struggle with this um i think there's mo- all kinds of people you know when it comes to their work uh most of us, I feel like, do what we do and we care about it. We don't just want to passively engage in our jobs. Um, and as a creator, you know, we're, we're artists and we want to do everything well. And we have an artistic expression that we're trying to get at, even if it's a silly corporate video. You're coming in with a point of view and you want to do it uh, with spe- specificity and with intention. And whenever a client starts coming back to you and saying, oh, you know what? do this instead and do that instead. Everything in you wants to like push against and say, well, here's why you don't want to do that. And sometimes, and this is what I'm trying to get at is you have to learn when to say, you know what? It doesn't matter. It's fine. What the client is asking for is completely fine. And they're the client and I'm not really losing anything by giving into this. Um, because for one, you're getting paid to do it, and ultimately the client should get what they're happy with. Um, even, but as a creator, you're walking this very fine line of making sure you're protecting the client from themselves, because that happens whenever they think they want a thing, and then they don't realize they don't know what they don't know. Um, and so sometimes on the back end, you have to make sure that you're creating a space that gives them what they ultimately want and sometimes in the process of production they start asking for things against their own you know uh, uh, wisdom you know in the moment and so whenever you're trying to make sure they're they're going to benefit from something you have to like learn to say you know what the thing that i'm fighting for doesn't actually matter um but it is good to fight for your perspective uh, but it's also good to know how much it matters and how much re- ROI you're going to get, how much return on investment of this fight you're going to get. Uh, because if it's something as simple as, you know, the the lens choice or the depth of field or uh, maybe even the wardrobe, like how much is that really going to matter at the end of the day? Uh, and just picking your battles and learning when to pick your battles, that can be a really hard thing to do uh, whenever you're used to just spending so much time in your headspace and creating and working through this vision. Um, And it can get very tempting to get a bunch of notes back from the client, you know, when they're at the end of this process and say, man, we, this flies in the face of everything we spent six months, you know, talking about. And now suddenly they've changed their mind. (laughs) 
<laughs> and it's so frustrating. But at the same time, uh, you need to take a breather and step back and say, you know what? It's fine, actually. It doesn't it doesn't actually matter at all. This is my own uh, pride and ego to some extent getting in the way of uh, just delivering something that the client you know enjoys and is going to help them. Because at the same time, you don't know everything that they know. And we have to trust that they are the experts in their field. Um, and you're an expert in filmmaking, but not an expert in what you just made a film on. And so there's this very fine line that you're constantly straddling mm. of when am I the expert and when am I not? Uh, because if I'm going out and making a, uh, a documentary about birds, I don't know anything about birds. Um, and so I don't know why this wide shot is much better than this close up of this beautiful bird. Maybe they're trying to, whatever, you know, demonstrate the, the environment, whatever. Yeah, I'm just trying to drive at this general idea. Um, but do you find that to be a struggle? Like learning to say, you know what? It's fine. It doesn't actually matter. I need to just, you know, punt this one away. Yeah, uh, all the time. I mean, you know, we work with, um, you know, big companies too, you know, Intel, Dell, mm. Cisco, you know, and, and um, a good example would be Cisco. Actually, we have a client that um, is very specific, like she knows what she wants, right? And, and you know, it's up to us to, to get it for her. And we've been working with her for years. So, you know, we kind of know what she what she means when she talks in circles because she does that a lot <laughs> and I, th I think that the biggest thing is is that is knowing when they when when a client tells you they want this or that understanding what that really means you know um it could be uh you know oh man i, I want something more it should be more dynamic here okay well what does that mean that could mean 10 different things could mean faster cuts it could mm. mean more animation it could you know just to, it depends um and so really understanding at the very beginning of the project what it is that the client is trying to accomplish that's the big thing like if they so i can't tell you the number of uh calls kickoff calls on projects i've been on where the client has no idea they're just either trying to spend money before their quarter is over mm. or or you know they think oh you know what we don't have enough video so let's let's make a video well i mean i mean sure we'll take your twenty thousand dollars but like wh what are we making you know and why because that really it it determines what we do and why we do it so um making sure that that the client knows what they want and if they don't give them a pitch say say you know we've done some research on your company and where where your assets lie and and we think that that this type of video at this length for this platform would do best for you uh, and and then at the end of that um if they agree great then you can move forward with this this these new parameters in place okay we're going to make you a 90 second animation and it's going to live here and it's going to drive traffic to your site you know here um, things like that. Uh, but if that stuff isn't in place in the beginning, then they will walk all over you all the way through the end, all the way. I mean, they'll probably will anyway, you know, like, nit you know, I have some clients that are totally fine with whatever we do and very few edits, you know, but for the most part, they come back and they're like, you know, like, oh, this, this second does this and whatever. It's like, really, it, it, it really doesn't matter. And so those are the things it's like, okay, well, it's not going to change the goal mm. of it. Right. And mm. that's what I think you're, you're getting at is that does, do these changes that the client is asking for, do they change the overall goal of the video itself, the overall goal of what it's supposed to do for the client? And if the answer is yes to that, is it better or worse? And if it's, if it is yes, does it change the whole scope of everything? Because then, you know, at least in our world, too much of that requires change fees and stuff. And, mm. you know, it it kind of gets messy, but I think you're right on about about knowing when to let go on certain things and knowing when to to double down, I guess, you know? Yeah. I think if it if it if it requires you doing a lot more work um when you're halfway through, then you know, maybe question it, maybe, you know, press them a little bit. And that's, that's probably a good, that's probably a good way of that. I would probably do it would be, Oh, you want us to turn 
this middle 15 second section into full animation that was live action okay uh that that could be really cool what is the purpose of that like is is that is it supposed to be a different type of video do we want to change this to an animated video instead you know things like that asking letting them direct you know give you the direct answers rather than you trying to make them up that's a really good point and yeah i mean it a feedback and no feedback and i was having a good conversation about this last night with a buddy because yesterday or uh yeah yesterday um i finished like writing my first feature and my buddy was asking me yes. about uh uh first draft um but he was asking like what are you going to send this to a bunch of people and get a bunch, you know, a lot more feedback? And I was like, well, yeah, I'll, I'll probably send it to a few people. And but the thing is, you got to really pick and choose because good feedback is hard to come by. Um, and we experience this a lot with our with our clients. Whenever they say something, you filter it in so many ways. Like, did they say this because they feel like they should have an opinion, and now they're just oh my god making sure they they have one. Um, or are they saying this because there's actually something wrong and now I need to fix it? Um, and if so, what are they saying is wrong through this nebulous note? <laughs> like, and now you're trying to yeah. decipher what you screwed up along the way. Um, and so whether it's, you know, professional or, you know, a passion project like a film, like I, you, luckily as a writer, I now get to pick and choose who I send this to. Um, because the last thing I want to do is send it to someone that doesn't really understand what it means to be a writer or a creator and that is just trying to have their thumb on the scale um, because I don't need that. I don't need someone coming mm -hmm. in and like with a wrecking ball wrecking my mental frame of mind of what I think I created. Um, I need someone that understands how to talk to me um, and, and appreciates what I'm trying to do, not not necessarily that you know they're gonna not say what they mean or not say what they feel, but understand that if they have a, a an idea and they're just trying to throw more ideas, oh well. Not, while I was reading this, I had all these thoughts. Um, this isn't to say that I think anything you're doing is wrong. These are just random things that occurred to me uh, that you know take it or leave it. Like you can easily throw it. And when someone approaches you with these things that are just like, hey, here's a bunch of random ideas throw them all away. I just had them and I wanted you to have them too. That's a completely different perspective than someone who comes and says, oh, what if instead of, you know, uh, you throw the laptop in the garbage, what if you use it to kill somebody? And you're like, whoa, is that, what does that mean? Like, are we trying to suggest that there's not enough bloodshed in, in this thing? Whatever, like having a good pointed note um, that the, the note giver understands why they're giving it to you and can properly express that uh, goes all the distance in the world. Whereas if you're getting bad notes, understanding how to interact with that, how to engage with that, and when it's a good time to push back on, if it's a client, especially knowing when it's going to be good to push back because protecting them is one thing, protecting the video is another thing. And if you do the wrong thing at the wrong time, you'll lose trust with your client. Um, and that's hard to get back. Mm -hmm. uh, the last thing oh, yeah. you want is for someone to say, uh, I like, I don't like working with Wes and Todd because they're, they're just difficult all the time. <laughs> and, uh, they, they start to feel when that's the case. And so if you don't know when that is, <laughs> when you're doing that, um, my God, you're going to have a really tough road. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> because we work with people like that, right? That, <clears throat> They just fight over everything. And you're just like, you know what? I don't want to work yeah. with you anymore. And you don't. <laughs> I mean, for real. Yeah. I mean, it's, you just, you just have to, uh, um, asking a lot of questions is a really good way around it. You know, l allowing them to, to answer their, because a lot of times clients will go into meetings and not know the answers to them. And so you're feeding them answers and, and they're processing that in real time. Um, not as accurately as if they were to have had the answers coming into the meeting. So instead, asking them questions, letting them them answer, you know, and take the time to think about it. And if they can't give you the answers, okay, well, maybe we should have, an, you should take some time and yeah. we should reconvene when you have those answers. I mean, it's totally fine. You know, it, it really doesn't matter if I start the video today or tomorrow or 
you know, the day after that, like, um, but yeah, it's, I, I mean, these are really good questions and I think that I mean, we could do a whole episode on <laughs> yeah, this kind of stuff. I've, I've had stories, I've had horror <laughs> stories, um, in the past in the recent past. Mm. Um, and then I've had some really awesome stories too. It, it really depends on the client, but at the same time, it mostly depends on you and how you respond to them knowing answers, having too many of them or not having any, yeah. right? It's, it's all about serving them. Um, and at the end of the day, you are a creator and that's why they're coming to you, but you need to create something like you said, you need to create something for them, right? For their specific purpose. And then you can, and I think you do this all the time and you mention it all the time. Like, like you slide in these little things that are just for you right yeah. into the video where yeah. <laughs> like, you know, they would probably never see it or never notice it or whatever, <laughs> but it's just for you in the edit. So, you know, there's a little piece of me out there, you know, in on this, this, uh, Dell video or whatever it is yeah. that, that nobody really knows this. So you know, true. And I love that. That's yeah. cool. Thanks, man. <laughs> yeah, man. So what are we going to cover today? Today we are uh, covering Tree of Life. So if you haven't seen uh, this film, please pause the episode, go watch it. Um, I guess we're going to spoil it. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> we'll see what that, we'll see what that really means. Yeah. Um, it is a handful for sure, but, uh, yeah. So pause the episode, go watch it. You can, you can stream it on YouTube. Um, I mean, it's like four bucks or something. Yeah. Um, but yeah. yeah. Nice. Yeah. The, this is by way of Alex. This was one of uh, her requests that she left a review. So always a good way to get us to cover a, a project that you want drop us a review. Um, so shout out to Alex. Thank you for doing that and for the request. And we're going to talk about a few things, literally. Um, we'll touch on some of the cinematography, the feeling of recreating childhood, um, shadows. Uh, we'll also discuss grace versus nature um, and other such stuff and things and stuff. And a quick synopsis of the film, uh, if you can call this that. Uh, is the story of a family in Waco, Texas in 1956. The eldest son witnesses the loss of innocence and struggles with his parents' conflicting teachings. Written and directed by Terrence Malick, cinematography by Emmanuel Lubetsky, starring Brad Pitt as father, Jessica Chastain as mother, Sean Penn as Jack, and Ty Sheridan as Steve. All I ever wanted for you was make you strong and grow up and be your own boss. Well, maybe I've been tough on you. I'm not proud of that. I'm as bad as you are. I'm more like you than her. It's about all I've done in life. Otherwise, I've drawn a zilch. You're all I have. You're all I want to have. So, oh man. Two separate questions, um, maybe the same answer, um, but I'm curious, one, uh, if you like this film, and two, uh, were you entertained? Oh man, those are two very good questions that are <laughs> somewhat separate. Um, so yeah, so going into it, I was a little apprehensive, you know, because I, I watched this movie 10 years ago. Um, when it came out and um, or just after it came out and remember thinking man this is super slow uh, you know um, and it's long 
So I was thinking, okay, here we go. You know, two and a half hours, whatever. Let's just do it. I sat down and honestly, I was, I loved it. I really liked it way more than I remember liking it. And I think it's just because of my, um, maybe, maybe because of this, this podcast, to be <laughs> honest, uh, you know, watching so many movies and under a critical eye and, um, just, but also not just a critical eye, but like a, 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 a creative eye. And, you know, also when I watched it before I wasn't a, a, a producer. So, um, mm. I wasn't watching it from the producer eye. I was, a, or even from the filmmaker eye, I was, I was watching it, just watching it. I was just, you know, taking it in. And I absolutely loved it. I thought it was genius. Um, uh, and, and yes, it was long, you know, but I kind of think it needed to be, you know? Yeah, sure. There, there was, this is weird. This is like the exception to the, you always say, cut out as much as you can and that's your film. Right. And then, <laughs> and then a little bit more and that's your film. Um, but I don't know, man. In this movie, I just loved all of, I loved the slowness. I loved all of the, the stuff that just kept going, you know, the, um, the, uh, the shot, like the, historical shots first, you know, of the, the universe being created. And then, you know, the primordial earth transforming into, then there was dinosaurs. Like that whole thing took like 15, 20 minutes or something insane. Uh, and I remember thinking at some point, like, God dang, this is so long, you know, but to be honest, sometimes life is long. And I feel like this movie is trying to say so many things and it says them all and it just depends on where you are in your in your own life as to what you're actually getting from it right and i think one of the things that i got from it was that life is long and life is short it's it takes forever and it is very fast and it's all of these things um and more hmm. and it was just told in such a beautiful way and I could sit there I could go back and watch it again and probably get something else from it or probably latch on to some other thing that was said that was whispered that maybe I kind of missed or you know or because like 90 percent of all of the the uh the lines in this film are whispered mm. and I have two kids in my house so <laughs> I probably missed a few lines um but also I I really identified not in the bad way um, with the dad, not in the, not in the worst of ways, but you know. Also, when I watched it before, I didn't have any kids, and now I have two, and I'm well aware of loving these creatures so much, but at the same time being so frustrated with them. And also, you know, if you if you don't, it, if you're not okay with yourself, you can't be okay with tough times with your kids, right? So if I'm not okay with where I'm at in my life or I'm depressed or I'm, you know, uh, um, uh, too busy with work or something, I I sometimes take it out on them. Now I never get physical, but I, I sometimes get short, you know, and they, they spill a glass of water or something, I get angry instead of saying it's okay, you know, things like that. Um, and also, uh, you know, so I watched it yesterday. Yesterday, it was funny. We went out. I'm just tell a little, little quick story. Quick, quick, quick. We went out on uh, uh, Lake Austin yesterday, or Lake Travis. No, Lake Austin yesterday. Um, and uh, we went to eat at at this place called Ski Shores, and they have this little, you know, one of those those games where it has the claw that comes down and mm. tries to grab one of the things, and you know, the money pit Ooh. things. Anyway, yeah, yeah. So. So we're there and, you know, the kids all have some quarters and stuff and they're playing games and stuff. And, you know, if you're standing behind a child who's, who's doing that game, it's very hard to not say, no, 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 go push it back a little farther, aim for that duck or whatever, you know, it's very hard to not do that. Right. Um, and I purposefully didn't do that to my daughter. I let her just whatever you want, baby, wherever you want to do it. You That's like that? That's a lot okay, of restraint. Great. And then she well hit done. the button. Yeah. <laughs> She hit the button and she got one. She got a toy. It actually worked. The claw grabbed a duck, picked it up, dropped it in, and she won. She was the only one of all the kids that did it. 
And it's, it made me feel like such a good dad, you know, to not do anything, to, to not tell her to give her advice. Because if I would have told her something, she probably wouldn't have gotten the duck, you know? Mm. But because I didn't say anything, because I said, do whatever you want, she got the duck. Um, and so I'm watching this movie later and, you know, there's this dad who, let's be honest, nobody knows how to raise kids. You don't, you just don't know. You, every day you're making decisions and hopefully they're good ones, but a lot of times they're not. And you have this dad who's trying to figure out how to raise sons, like strong, you know, sons in the fifties, um, where, you know, women didn't go to work usually. And, uh, it, the man was the bread maker and all, you know, all this stuff. And you had to raise strong ki- sons and he's trying to do his best and he loves his, his kids, but he's still failing in a lot of ways. Uh, and you know, my fails are smaller than his fails. Uh, you know, obviously he gets pretty physical, but, um, but there's this huge dichotomy with him because in one scene he'll tell his like the scene you played was beautiful that was the scene of the movie that was like oh my gosh and he he never says he loves him he never can do that but he says everything but and and that's a wonderful thing but then you know like there's a scene later he's like violent with his son anyway uh so there's that i can latch on to there's the there's the relationship between him him and and mother um, there's a relationship between the son and the mother, uh, or all the sons really. There's the moving away. Um, there's this the where where one of his um, his older brother di- or younger brother dies. Uh, the scene in the beginning. Um, it's it's there's so much to it. So I'm gonna I'm just gonna, gonna stop because I feel like I'm just talking over myself. But I. Uh, I absolutely loved it. I loved all the ethereal stuff, the, the you know, like um, the slow moving, slow edit stuff. I loved all the space stuff, even though it was obviously not space, most of it, um, if not all of it, except for I, the horse head nebula, nebula looked real, but everything else looked pretty, you know, either f- fake or like one of those things where they use, they do close up shots on ink, you know, and, mm. and make make a uh, uh, kind of like space shots like that whatever it was I loved it and I loved the slowness of it and I loved um, when it came out of that and we you know saw Sean Penn thinking I mean I don't even know how many lines he had he probably had like four lines in the whole movie uh, yeah yeah I, I loved it wow yeah I'll... and and was I entertained mm. um no Hmm. no not really um i was more experiencing it i would say than entertained uh entertainment is like you know what uh uh, um, the avengers that's entertaining (laughs) right um but but this is not entertaining this is just it's kind of like um you know some um uh, it's kind of like boyhood or movies like that. There's just, it, it's an experience, right? You're going to, we're going to take you here. We're going to leave you here. And whatever happens in between is kind of just what we captured. Um, and I, I know this was, you know, more scripted than that, but uh, I liked the chances he took. I liked him trying to make statements all over the place. Um, you know, that's just th- this kind of movie that he wanted to make, you know, life is confusing too. And a lot of times you can have, you know, crazy feelings at any moment. And it's, I just feel like he's trying to capture all those moments throughout a lifetime. Wow. Yeah. What about you? Yeah, it's funny. I mean, I don't know. I think Boyhood was probably far more scripted than this. Um, mm-hmm. uh, my, that's me guessing. It's funny because I yeah. got to see that with uh, Linkletter in the room and Patricia Arquette and, and, the, and the boy. Um, and so it was a fun, that was a really fun experience. Um, just sitting there listening to them talk about this nearly, you know, this Oscar contending film. Um, but this felt like it was very, I'm experimenting and this is probably one of the most expensive experimental films, you know, ever made because it had like over $30 million budget according to, 
Uh, I don't even know what I was looking at, but um, I mean, I same. I, f- I think I feel the exact same. I went in expecting to not really like it. I remember watching it the first time and really liking it, um, but then also really feeling like I'm probably not going to watch that again for another decade. Um, and here we are a decade later, and <laughs> I, I do watch it again. I'm like, yeah, you know what? I think I do love this. Um, and I agree, not entertaining, okay. um, but it's it's... He's tried to do this a, a few more times after making this film, and it has not worked again. Um, but this film really works. It's ruminating, and it's just, it is an experience. It's its inviting you to reflect on your own life and on your, your own upbringing and um, how it all ties together with, you know, the, the, the tree of life, you know, um, which to me is this very, I'm sure there's some really cool book or philosophy based around that you know, phrase, but whenever, you know, you think of the tree life, you think about how we're all connected and that, yeah, we all branch off and we are all on our own little separate, uh, spot. But at the end of the day, we all come from the same place. Uh, you know, if you go far enough back in time, um, and in our DNA, uh, we're all living things, all living things on earth, you know, all come from the, the same starting points. Um, and so, yeah, I did. I did love it. I I thought it was beautiful, and um, I loved spending time in that headspace and uh, just feeling those emotions and contemplating like my own upbringing in in light of especially what this kid is going through. And I, I like also appreciate that unlike Boyhood, it's a snapshot. Like we're we're staying in one space. Like we're we're gonna see him a little bit as an adult. Um, but mostly him in this one stage of life, in this one house, um, in this one little moment, and we're going to hang out there, and it's not going to be super specific. We're just going to let him experience whatever he's going to experience and um, feel and think and kind of roll through all these moments and uh, collide with his dad and even his mom, right? His dad goes out of town, and um, he goes through this... Uh, moment with his mom where he's like why should I do anything you you tell me to you let him run over you too and um, I, I'm not going to listen to you and he's just very strong willed or at least he wants to be because even in that moment he doesn't run he stands right there and he, mm-hmm. he lets his mom kind of uh, be there with him and that's such an interesting choice and so I feel like he he came up with all these ideas of moments and uh, would just run through them and from what I understand, there's a lot more. There's so much footage that he ended up. I can't tell you how many people I know that worked on this film. Um, that, really? Yeah, tons. Oh, uh, wow. Junior editors, like they. I don't even think they're in the credits. Like, um, or maybe they are, and I, I just didn't read through like the the actual credits. I looked through the IMDb, and I didn't see any of their names. But junior editors just sitting, going through so much b-roll uh and i i always mean to pick their brain but i've yet to hear exactly what they were doing in there Uh, but i just imagine um like this shot like a sweatshop of just people sitting around (laughs) desktops and looking through footage um but yeah i I i'd say my experience was very similar i don't have kids and so in that way very different um but yeah i i I imagine I empathize with him um, because I can still kind of see what he sees. He's trying to get something out of his kids. And, um, and so he gets frustrated and um, he's, he's doing it the worst way. I also imagine him, you know, this is supposed to take place in the late fifties, 1957. And so this guy probably fought in world war two. And as a man who's come out of that um, alive, you know, what does that do to, to your perspective in life? Um, what does that mean to you as someone who's trying to prepare his kid for reality? Like, how do you approach that? Um, because there was no way to, and I'm sure a lot of men who went into World War II were raised by fathers who went through World War I. Um, and so there was a, a, a imprint left on these people um, that they're, they're trying to press on people who are, you know, getting ready to go through Vietnam, you know, and uh, and so there's this very unspoken and maybe it's not supposed to be like even factored in uh, for all we know, but 
that kid died in Vietnam in the opening sequence, right? We see a kid uh, mm -hmm. who his mom is discovering that uh, he's been killed and um, we see her reacting to the loss of a child. And, and so a lot of this is kicked off through something that's, you know, ambiguous from the beginning. We don't really know. They don't really spell it out. Um, it's just kind of implied. And so uh, all these things are just kind of congealing in this, in this very vague way. Um, and that's kind of the, the fun of the film is you're inserting your own life into the story. You know, what you walk away with is as much as what you came in with as it is with what the film gives to you. Um, and that's really interesting. So I feel like in 10 years, it'll be a different film um, just from the nature of what I'm bringing to it um, at that point mm -hmm. in my life. Um, yeah, I don't know, man. I enjoyed it. I, I, I don't think it's something you should watch every year, but uh, <laughs> if for no other reason, it's, it's to give yourself time to change so that you can carry mm -hmm. something new into it. Um, yeah, I, <laughs> I don't know. I love yeah. all the space stuff. I love that he goes into this very strange idea of, well, where does it begin? <laughs> where does it really begin? This kid, you know, is having a hard time with his father. Let's look at the nature of creation itself, right? Because it's a parent and a child, a parent who created this child. And it's such a weird thing to, as a kid, to try to have this idea. And I don't know that this kid had this idea, but in retrospect, you know, this kid is looking at a father and maybe asking this father like why are you treating this creation this way you created me why are you treating your own creation this way um and so we go back to the nature of creation and we see uh like this i don't know what you know dinosaur this is but we see him challenging his own progeny right he's pressing his foot on his head and he's kind of trying to teach it to be tough and then you know we see a dad teaching his son to box and to fight and to fend for himself. And that's a crazy scene because uh, as, a, as a bystander, you're watching this interaction and you're like, man, you are just intense. Like, you, this is too much. You're asking your kid to like really give it to you. Um, and then you feel the father's disappointment in them. And so we're empathizing really hardcore with those children. Um, but there's also something interesting about trying to teach your kids to be tough and like to is that the right way is it and i think it goes exactly by what you said no one no parent knows what they're doing like you're all making it up um and mm -hmm. at the end of the day you you most parents are trying to do what they think are right the ones that are actually trying um and yeah. he was trying like we could all mm -hmm. probably argue that he did it the worst way uh, but maybe he learned along the way. Maybe what happened, we don't know what happened after that, right? He, he's yeah. effectively apologizing to his kid about, you know, I'm sorry for, you know, I, I regret the way I, I've been raising you. Um, maybe he changed after that. We don't really know this again. It's just a snapshot. Uh. Yeah. I, I, it's <laughs> when he finds out. So, so first Jessica Chastain finds out that, that her son died and then and then he finds out you know he gets that phone call by the plane um and then you know throughout the next few minutes they're you know he they're dealing with it he's reminiscing and he actually says things like oh, he actually regrets the way that he treated him and he says a few things like i would i would sit there and watch him play piano and i would criticize the way he would turn the pages you know and th th those are I cannot tell you how many times I have I have failed with my kids and immediately thought those exact things like like how dare I how dare I not be perfect to them all the time and immediately I want to go to them and apologize and I do I do a lot of times I'll go to them and I'll apologize and I'll say I'm not perfect I'm trying and I'm working on it so please forgive me and uh, I'll do better, you know, and I expect the same from them, you know, and they, when they mess up or they, my, you know, Simon speaks, you know, cruelly to his sister or something. Uh, 
and it, it's just it because I don't want to wake up one day and if if you know something happens and say man I you know I want to be the best dad I possibly can be for them I want them to have the best childhood so um I, I don't know it, it really spoke to me I think probably more, more on the parent um aspect but um at least in this conversation but um I also you know this is how I grew up too I grew up playing outside constantly with my friends and I didn't have any brothers, but had a lot of friends that I would play outside with. Isn't your family would... good enough? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was that line. Was like, that line was like, was like, what? Damn, bro. Come on, man. <laughs> good <You know>? God. <laughs> uh, man. Uh, but, but Hey, how about those kids? Bro. What? Yeah. Unbearable acting. Yeah. Just, it's not fair. So it's really good. not fair. <laughs> Above and beyond most 90% of adults that I watch on screen. Like they just brought it every moment. I felt was so real and so it it felt unscripted. It felt yeah. just you're in the room when this just happened to happen or you're in this their space when this happened to happen. And it's not like you're shooting mediums. You're shooting like super close up most of the time so it's not it's not like they could just act like oh there's not a camera in my face right, right. now no there's a big ass camera right in your face and you have to deal with this and if you have a line deliver it or a reaction deliver it and uh, man they just <laughs> un unreal and jessica chastain is just mind-boggling in this movie like she's my mother in this movie uh -huh. you know like she's is probably one of my f my favorite uh, films that I've seen her in, to be honest. I just feel like it's so honest. She's so real mm. and honest. And that scene in the kitchen after he got, like, after he blew up on, on the kid and she's just so mad, but they don't say any words. And she, like, shoves the thing in his face and he holds her and she's just, you know, deciding to stop fighting so he'll let her go. Like, oh, so painful. It's an interesting conversation that they're having. And I feel like the the meat of the story is with the dad even though we rarely if ever uh, see anything from his perspective but i think yeah. ult ultimately it's, it's a movie about him um because at the beginning right we get this uh this kind of thesis kind of laid out for us which is uh grace versus nature and she starts defining grace in the in the uh, voiceover with grace doesn't try to please itself um uh, accepts being slighted being forgotten, disliked, accepts insults and injuries, right? And he is none of those things. The father is just, you're not getting away with none of that. Um, because nature, she says, only wants to please itself and get others to please it too and lord it over them uh, to have its own way. It finds reasons to be unhappy when all the world is shining around it. <sighs> Damn. And then she goes on to say, no one ever comes to love through grace. You only come to love um, through through nature, and and so I feel like it's about him coming to love through nature and finding ultimately grace, um, and and that's I think where he finally gets it right when he loses his job and he has to reflect on you know what is it all what do I have like um, he was starting to kind of pump up these big ideas big dreams that you know I think I just got back from China and around the world. Um, and I think, you know, I'm about to be the man, uh, look at all these patents I've been st stacking up and we see his patents amount to nothing and he doesn't get this, uh, thing in China and then he gets laid off, right? He gets cut. Um, and now he comes to realize all this stuff that I've been trying to fight, uh, to please myself, um, and to, to make myself into be a big man. Um, it's, it doesn't amount to anything. And the only thing that I really have uh, is is my legacy with my kids and uh, my family um, and that's when he finally comes to love and comes to grace and, and so in my mind he becomes that person he becomes this graceful uh, father with a new new perspective yeah um, I, I think it's that's a very positive way to to <laughs> carry out the next nine years of their of their life until we you know get to that scene where his son dies um, hopefully it's a better, um, better de following decade yeah. uh, than the the first one because 
Yeah, and maybe uh, not. Man, it, it, be, be, sorry. Just to uh, uh, like contradict myself entirely, because we also see in that opening scene his wife being comforted by a neighbor and him saying, "Okay, that's enough." I can. Yeah. So yeah, maybe, we're maybe, okay. Maybe not. Maybe he's still working okay. on getting there. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think in that. I, th- I don't know. I think in that scene. Uh, I try to understand anytime someone reacts a certain way when you know like if someone dies or 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 whatever and it's a way that I wouldn't react I tr- I really try to understand why that is because I would hope that someone would understand the way I would react which I personally would shut down completely I would I would die inside um and I f- feel like what I was trying to what I I was trying to understand why he would say that and I think it's just because someone being there talking about it, someone being there consoling, means it's real. Hmm. You know, if his son had been away, was away fighting in Vietnam, then he hasn't seen his son, right? So it's it's like his son is still away, right? But as long as someone is there and they're talking about missing him and, and well, you got, you've got the other two. Fuck you. Are you kidding me? It was like the worst thing. Anyway, as long as someone's there consoling him, he, you know, them, then it's real. So it's like, no, we'll be okay. Please just get the fuck out of here so that I can act like it didn't happen. Because, you know, yeah, that's easier to deal with wow. right, than actually accepting it. I don't know. I buy into that. I think that's... Yeah, sure. Why not? Yeah. <laughs> Because otherwise, then he was just still an asshole. Still an asshole, and even worse, during the death of his son. <laughs> like, that's yeah peak dick right there. <laughs> yeah. Peak dick. <laughs> Can I use that? Yes, I'm going to keep that. Please. I'm going to use that. <laughs> awesome. Uh, but I love that moment, too, whenever she gets the letter, she opens it, um, and she starts to break down and i love that they clip right there they they edit they they truncate you know her mm. her grief and cut straight to this really loud airplane uh audio um as we cut to the tarmac and him on the phone and he's listening he's like yeah i can't hear you you know what what are you saying what are you saying and then it's really loud until the news hits him and then the audio slowly fades away just as his uh, as we enter more into what he's experiencing and it's that's a really great sequence because we don't technically know what happened. Um, we're, yeah. we're inferring from the edit, from the reaction. Um, and what's really tricky about that is that it's not that the time gap between their childhood and that scene is not that big where they age them up a ton. And because and the thing is you could also assume maybe that, that, that was their parents dying. They, were, they got a letter about you know a family member dying, um, and so they they did it in a really well enough to allow me to assume that the son died, um, even though we hadn't. Uh, I don't, we did we didn't have quite enough information to make that uh, assumption. I don't think. Uh, I don't remember mm-hmm. feeling in that moment. Uh, there was a question there, and I, I really respected that because it kept me engaged until I got confirmation um, through, I don't even remember who, it might have been a, a voiceover um, from the big brother, uh, adult Jack, uh, Sean Penn's character, um, whenever he, I think he voiceovers yeah. something about his brother's death. Um, and I'm like, okay, yeah, that was, that was their son. Um, yeah, I don't know, but that's a really interesting moment to just kind of leave us there uh, and in a very good way to make us engage with the film for information and a film like this that's absolutely critical (laughs) or else you know we will start kind of disengaging um and that's that's the tricky thing about a film like this and it's what's interesting to me is that i just pitched on friday morning uh, a project not completely unlike this uh at least uh, in presentation because a film like this you're, there's ebbs and flows and you're creating moments of engagement with story and then allowing these moments of rumination um, that allows the audience to kind of drift away and 
right when maybe the audience is ready to just kind of walk out, um, you pull them back in with a little bit more story and you re-engage them. That you give, it's this push and pull of allowing them to drift away and then calling them back. Uh, and it's delicate. It's a very delicate dance. And I think Terrence Malick did a masterful job with it because I do come back. Every time uh, I think that I'm about done, um, he finds a moment to, to, to say, hey, no, let's, let's see what this, what's happening in this moment. There's a kid drowning. Let's, let's see what it's like. Can his dad raise, um, raise himself to the, to the moment? And he can't. The kid, the kid passes away. And now we're looking at the dad a little bit differently. This guy who's so cocksure and, and just thinks he can do everything. When mm-hmm. it mattered the most, he let this kid die. And we lose a little bit of awe and respect for him in that moment um, where it could have gone the other way. Imagine if he let that kid live in the story. Um, now there's reverence mm-hmm. there. Uh, and that's mm-hmm. a completely different tone that you're setting for the rest of this film. Uh, so that's a really beautiful choice um, that I, I just love. I adore it. Um, that's great insight there. I, didn't, I, I knew there was something important about that because it was, it was a kid that, there was like a friend. It wasn't their son or anything. Yeah. Uh, so why show it? But oh, that to really humanize the father. That makes perfect sense, right? And this is the kind of stuff, man. That's the kind of stuff, right? Like why we talk about this, this, and why you know he would Terrence Malick would make a movie like like this, right? So you could get that, say it, and it could be like, oh my gosh, that's a pu- piece of the puzzle. This is like a thousand piece jigsaw puzzle, yeah. right? Where it takes teamwork to put this thing together um, where I might not be able to find a piece. You sit down and you find that exact piece that links this whole thing together. And I think that that is a really great insight into that moment. And what it, what follows is just as interesting too, because uh, it's after that, that the kid starts getting a little bit more destructive. He, Mm. he blows up that frog on the rocket and his mom gets after him about that. Um, he shoots his brother with a BB gun and he feels bad. Um, but I love how slowly he comes around to accepting that. Um, and you can feel a little bit of the tension of, I don't want to go home right now because I might get in trouble. Um, and then he finally gets home and he realizes his brother hasn't, you know, said anything, or at least we don't see that happen. And he apologizes to his, to his brother and he gives him this like two by four. And he's like, you can hit me if you want. And his brother starts. Yeah taunting him with it you know yeah but he never does he never does um and it's uh it's a real moment like that kind of stuff happens uh for sure happened with me and my brothers like we would just wail on each other man it was it was brutal um well and how how great of a of a you being a brother like how mm. great is it for them to tell us my brother died when he was 19 we don't know why, but at the beginning, right? And so then the whole relationship between the brothers is unique now, wow. right? So that the you you mentioned about the the BB gun right before that, you know, he had the lamp. Mm. Um, the older brother had the Sean Penn's character had the lamp, and the younger brother um, stuck a wire in it, right? And he says, "I trust you," right? And then the whole well, then he shoots him with a BB gun and then he feels bad and he takes, you said, takes that whole time to say, I'm sorry. Um, as a brother, which I'm not a brother, as a brother, like, do you ident- did you identify with that relationship? Like how they would, you know, they didn't really fight, you know, so much. Mm. They loved each other a lot, but that moment in particular of like failure, I guess, to of trust. Yeah, it's interesting. And you're right. They didn't fight with each other because they were so uh, terrified of their dad. Um, yeah. He kept, he kept all that animosity at bay. Um, yeah, I would say I connected with it on that level. Um, and to me, it's one of those things you don't know what you don't know. I'm kind of assuming everyone feels this way when watching these kind of moments when, of course, they don't. Like, uh, you had a sister. And so your interactions with your sister were very different from my interactions with my, my two big brothers, I'm the youngest. Um, and so I grew up fighting, like used to, mm-hmm. to, to fighting for myself and, um, and losing a lot of fights. Like I never want to fight with my, my oldest brother, but I never back down either. Like I would just freaking square up and we're going to go and I'm going to get knocked down and 
guess what? I'm coming right back. <laughs> and, um, and so, yeah, there's, there's those moments. Cause I, I do remember like, uh, oh man, I was a, I remember being a kid and I, I must've been, I don't know, three, maybe four. And I swung a broom at my, my, my middle brother. He and I fought the most and, uh, those were wins and losses. Um, but he got it, he got it, you know, clip on the head with this broom that apparently had this little uh, nail inside um and oh, yeah. i like i drew blood and i felt terrible i didn't mean to hit him with the freaking nail um i just wanted to whack my brother in the head with a broom like we're we're just joshing around and he 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 forgave me he was like it's okay blood coming down his face <laughs> He's like, in the moment he forgave you yeah immediately wow it's like oh wow yeah, and so even though he took longer, right, to get to that moment, yeah, I would say I was connecting with this version of myself that's like, you know what? Maybe I'm not gonna do, <laughs> I'm not gonna do that anymore. Uh, and I think at yeah. one point I accidentally shot him in the face with a BB gun, but <laughs> it was very much an accident at that time. <laughs> this is like a like a Dick Cheney moment. <laughs> Oh, with your brother. That's so great. Oops, sorry. I thought the safety was on. I thought the leaf was going to stop the BB. Um, but they are not as sturdy as... <laughs> Those leafs, they don't make them as sturdy as they used to. No, they don't. Uh, oh, I mean, that's that's so funny. I think that's a sibling thing, too, not just brothers. The other day, Simon thought, for whatever... I think I told you this the other day, but he was... he. Um, you know that that whole game where you someone's not looking and you put your finger by their face and you say hey so and so and they turn around and you know you poke yeah. them in the cheek well he did that to my daughter but with a fork <laughs> with a fork and he and she turned around and he stabbed her in the eye with a fork and he immediately was so scared that he hurt her like yeah. so scared he was in tears like like screaming crying she was screaming and crying obviously but she immediately forgave him after she knew that she was okay right yeah um uh but we had a serious talk about like dude you gotta <laughs> treat your sister better so anyway that's, that's hilarious you that's also shot your brother with a bb gun indeed multiple uh, times sometimes we would do like wars where like six of us would go in the back country and just hammer each other with oh bb God. guns yeah it was <laughs> bumpkins wow. we were hicks man i don't even want to get started <laughs> <laughs> Do you have notes for this film? We've I think we've been talking for an hour, and yeah. I don't know if we hit your notes. Uh, a little bit. Uh, the cinematography, I mean, they they seem to do a lot of wide-angle lenses, especially in people's mm. closer personal space, and that really pulls you in, man, because uh, now you can oh, yeah. really feel their presence, and every everything that moves in that, in that camera is, just gets dramatized that much more. I mean, you get that out of a close-up, but a close-up on a... On a wide angle lens is that much more dramatic um and then recreating childhood was interesting because they they would stick with these wide wide angles but then they would shoot a lot of stuff not everything but a lot of these low angles um and it kind of dramatizes the memory of childhood right it reinforces the perspective of a child whenever you're you're a kid you're small and you're looking up at everything and everything feels so much bigger i don't know if anyone's ever like gone back and visited places they were they remember as a kid and then it feels everything feels so much smaller now and that's because you know you've grown up your perspective has changed um and uh you know the the single wide trailer i'm sure that i grew up in uh, at various points in my life you know would feel just tiny but it, at, at that age it felt massive and um huge uh, I, even though there were six people in there it was like uh and so i love that wow. he shot it in that way you know um, and then so they're, they're constantly bouncing around. And so I liked how many like continuous shots that he used. He would really help a moment settle in by trying to reduce the amount of coverage. He wouldn't always get a ton of coverage within a moment. He would try to stick to mm -hmm. one uh, kind of angle. But then even, even if he was, uh, sometimes he would let it just play out for 20, 30 seconds before cutting to a whole new scene. Uh, but sometimes you would also just jump cut within that angle. 
and it kind of lets us stay in this moment while creating new emotions and new perspectives uh, through the use of jump cuts. Um, and that was interesting. It, you know, you could just feel kind of the the memory happening, like these flashbacks of uh, this thing unfolding and just kind of cutting to uh, the the pertinent things about it. Um, yeah, and so I don't know. I had a bunch of other random notes. I don't know that any of it really adds up to much. Um, I mean, it's 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 great point about the jump cuts because they're all over the place, yeah. and normally that kills a mo- that would kill a movie, right? I mean, there's one part, there's one moment. I guess I don't. I think it's towards the beginning where he breaks the 180 rule, even mm-hmm. where. I mean, I think uh, mother and father are walking in the street and mother's walking and in front and father's behind her. And then all of a sudden they cut like 180 and they're shooting mother, but father is behind the camera. Yeah. And it's so weird. You know, you probably know what shot I'm talking about. It's so weird. And it like puts you off completely, but it sets you up also for the rest of the movie because yeah. that kind of stuff happens all over the place. And I think it's, Maybe it's one of those things where if you do it once or twice, you're going to screw it up, right? It's not enough. But if you do it all the time and that's and it's a style, then all of a sudden, maybe it can work as long as you, you know, if the shots are beautiful, mm. which they are. I mean, every shot is just <laughs> gorgeous. Absolutely gorgeous. Yeah. I, I wonder if, uh, and take this with a massive grain of salt because this is Emmanuel Le- Le- Lubez- oh God, I'm gonna butcher his name. Uh, cinematography, Emmanuel Lubezki, um, mm-hmm. is is a master. But uh, there's probably a benefit to the way they shot too, because you can do a little bit of what you may call spray and pray, like just shoot as much oh, as yeah. you can, and then in post uh, have you know 20 junior editors go through and find your most beautiful shots. Um, and now you know you, you shot. 300 hours of content and uh, you can pick out these really gorgeous moments uh, for a two hour and 15 minute movie. Um, but one of the things that they, they used, you know, a fair amount of was shadows. There's a lot of these, you know, shadows dancing on the ground and these silhouettes. And um, I really love that. I think that it's interesting from the standpoint thematically, uh, shadows are the results of light casting on us. Um, it's what happens when we cast light. So it may, might be kind of this question that's implied. What happens when we cast light on these characters? What shadows do they project? Um, and so, you know, the father is casting a shadow over his kids. And um, all, all of this is kind of a, a reflection on their lives. And um, maybe to some degree, light and shadow is reflecting on the theme of or the thesis of the film, comparing grace versus nature, um, maybe looking at it as a uh, good versus bad, um, I don't know, uh, scenario of what's what's good and what's bad, and um, how how who where are these characters living? I don't know. On the other hand, it's also just beautiful sh- beautiful shots. You know, um, maybe it's, mm-hmm. there's no thematic. It's just again what we in, in, insert or br- walk away from. Uh, from watching this thing but yeah i would say yeah i got a lot of a lot of like religious warring um Mm. not necessarily from the characters um or the script even (laughs) uh more so of just thematically felt like you know there were those moments like what you played of of of, i tithe every sunday like how could this happen well but there's also a um a moment where Um, the priest says in in church you know bad things happen to good people he talks about job in fact the the film opens with a quote from uh uh, i don't know is it from job i can't remember it's job and um, that that's a running thing even the priest uh, references job uh, during one of their regular sunday sessions yeah 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 so kind of this this whole thing of, of like good things happen or bad things happen to good people um uh, so <laughs> it just is like, it's just, it's not good or bad. It's just life, I guess. I don't know. Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm a little cynical when it comes to that kind of stuff. So I, I, I choose to, you know, look at it and say, oh, this is, this is, um, you know, an argument against religion or, or whatever, but it's probably not, hmm. not. Yeah. You know. And I, I glanced at Joe cause I was curious about, 
is there something else within Job? Because I think we all understand the general story of Job being that uh, God allowed Satan to test, you know, his most faithful servant um, or one of his faithful servants and um, believing in that Job would still love and worship God despite whatever came his way. And so, you know, he lost his house, his family. I mean, he just, he took everything, right? I think he was, had boils all over his body. I mean, every time this guy withstood something, uh, Satan would just throw something even worse at him. It was just like, man, um, what's left? And still he praised God. And um, so, but beyond that, and so it's the, exactly what you just said, good things happen to bad people, uh, or <laughs> bad things happen to good bad people. Thing. Uh, but the same, yeah, the inverse yeah. is true, of course. Um, and beyond that, I don't, I'm, I'm curious, I'm, part of me wants to just reread it because uh, there's also some overlap with uh, a story I'm working on. Um, and I, but off the top of my head, I don't know if there's anything deeper than that. If there's other, you know, ore that he was mining out of that book of the Bible, um, because it it seem, it does seem superficial, even though he opens with a quote and uh, it's referenced, uh, you know, once or twice and throughout the film. Um, and yeah, I don't know, Job. Well, I mean, you know, I. I don't I don't know that it is superficial. I feel like the whole thing could be because he starts off with a quote. Um it could be uh I mean like everything, you know, even th- these kids, you know, they're born into this life with this dad who's, you know, abusive and in a lot of ways. The 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 mother is wonderful. She's just fantastic and she's treated not not good either and and then the son who is so good and so good hearted um, ends up dying. And uh, I just, I don't necessarily feel like anybody in this film, even the dad necessarily, cause he's just like, he's just sad. Like he wanted to be a musician, you know, and that, ne- that never happened. And so this is his life, right? And so I feel like none of these people really deserved what they got Mm -hmm. um and in any way even sean penn's character is so sad you know later in his life like um because he lost his brother and his upbringing stuff so i don't know but that's why i call it superficial is because i don't pick up any i wouldn't say any of these characters are really a job um we don't know much about the mom Uh, there's not quite enough loss and so yeah it feels you know like a i'll there might be something it's more deeper. about a test. Yeah, yeah, and so there might be something deeper if I, you know, actually go back and read the the story, the whole book again. Um, but from mm-hmm. the opening, I don't know. I think I read just six or seven verses at the beginning. Um, yeah, I don't know what else would be there that would really play into some of some of this story that you know really helps. I don't know. Tell the story, and so yeah. And then, um, anyway, <laughs> so, um, yeah, what Sweet. are you going to recommend this week? Uh, okay, uh, so this week I'm going to go out of the box, not recommend a, a movie necessarily, uh, yeah, or at all. Um, I just got back from Disney World with my with my family, and I'm going to recommend Disney World. Uh, it, it's expensive, I know, and some people have problems with it and everything, whatever. It's amazing. Um, whether you have kids or not, what, the moment that I got there, I felt like a kid again. I really, really did. And that sounds f- like, you know, cliche, but it is amazing. And, um, and they literally, like everyone there is, that works there is there for you all the time. My wife was sick the entire time. The day we were supposed to leave, she had to go to the hospital um, we missed our flight and they completely took care of us. I, like they gave us an extra night for free. Uh, they transported her to the hospital for free in an ambulance because they're their own city apparently. And so they can do that kind of thing. Um, they gave us free food that night. They just like completely took care of us. And the whole time we were there, it, you know, 
they were so kind and like loved my kids and my kids had a blast. Uh, so if you have the opportunity to go, I absolutely recommend it. Um, it was a fantastic time and, and we've been wanting to do this. We want to go every 10 years. We went for our anniversary, or I mean for our, our honeymoon, wanted to go last year for our 10 year, couldn't cause of COVID. So mm. went this year and we're going to go again in nine years. And it's, uh, it's just, you know, every now and then really good to go feel like a kid again. So Disney world. Nice. Very cool. Um, yeah. I'm going to recommend, uh, it's a, I don't even know what to call it. So if you, if you like this kind of ruminating thing, um, there's a, there's a, there's a film on Netflix uh, or excuse me, a film on Hulu, um, called in and of itself. It's Derek Glaudio Joe. I, I've already butchered his name. Um, just <laughs> look up in and of itself. And here's the thing. It's, I don't know that I like it. Um, I huh? I found it very well done. Um, I felt at certain points manipulated, um, which it, I guess being a filmmaker and a writer, I can and an actor, I, I see everything that's happening and why it's happening, and and so part of me um, kind of pushes back against feeling manipulated. Um, but at the same time, it's still a really good experience and uh, interesting and very, very well done. Um, and so I invite you to check that out and make up your own mind. I feel like Tree of Life is a pretty divisive film and, and, and who likes it and who doesn't. Uh, and so in that same way, I think um, in and of itself was, will probably be a little divisive as well. Um, and so, yeah, go check that out. Um, yeah, and stay tuned for next week. We are going to take on a little show called Shit's Creek. I'm sure some people have heard of this thing, and uh, it's it's a, it's a it's a full thing. And we'll I'm sure we'll talk about the entire run of the show, but um, I don't know that I'll have time to wa- rewatch the entire thing again. Um, but I challenge you. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I can. Just it's possible. Just kidding. I know you can. I know. Don't do it. <laughs> I've, I've already watched the first season, uh, rewatched it and made some notes. And so we'll see okay. how much further I get. Um, anyway, so stay tuned for that. We'll, we'll be covering Shit's Creek next week. And if you're enjoying this episode or at least other episodes, maybe this is not your favorite. Um, but if it is, then uh, feel free to go drop us a review. Uh, leave us a note on iTunes saying what you like and if you want us to cover something else. Uh, big shout out to Alex for the request. Um, thanks for listening and uh, hopefully we, we fulfilled uh, what you wanted out of this. If not, tell us where we missed it. Uh, leave Please us a do. note and, and drop us some, some ideas on how you, how you felt. Uh, same thing to you, Charlie. I know you recently rewatched this and so I'd love to hear your thoughts also. Um, and if you want to leave a note on this episode, you can do that at the pestlepodcast.com slash the tree of life. And we'll leave you with a quote of the day from Carl Sagan. If you want to make an apple pie from scratch, you must first create the universe. <laughs> wow. That's so big because That's massive. I felt like that kind of answers why we started. Uh, why, why did we go back in this film all the way back to the big bang right it's like um and it's because if this kid wants to find out why is my dad the way he is well you got to go back to the beginning son (laughs) like (laughs) once upon a time there was nothing everything could fit on the pin of a head um yeah uh, the head of a pin so yeah i don't know that's about as far as i went with that (laughs) no it's brilliant i mean the, yeah, I don't have anything to add to that. That's fantastic. And it's a great, great way to describe this film, too. Yeah. Um, it's just, <laughs> it is what you want to take from it, but it is, right? But it is. Just it. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, this has been really fun. I actually was much more um, uh, excited and happy, um, you know, when I got through the first 20 minutes of this film. I was like, oh, I actually like this. But yeah. the entire time was just fantastic. So great. Great reco there. Um, uh, had a great time with you, man. This was fun. Awesome. Uh, so like Wes, like Wes said, please uh, review us, share us with your friends. All that stuff helps. And uh, uh, follow us on Patreon. All that good stuff. We really appreciate 
any and all uh, feedback. Uh, so leave comments, all that stuff. Uh, until next time, I'm Todd. I'm Wes. Go watch some movies. <laughs> what was that? I don't know. I was just like, no. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to be tired when yeah. I say <laughs> I'm Tired of being Wes. I'm...